Hello, I'm Vladimir Mitev. Today we are going to learn more about a special relationship of affection between the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek and his Iranian public. Žižek is quite popular internationally and is used to, call, to be called the rock star of philosophy. And he is a celebrity of the left-wing circles, known for challenging conventional thinking. But what makes Iranian be so fond of him? Uh, it looks like it turns out there are ten or more Zizek's books translated into Persian. So, do Iranians like his intellectuality, or maybe his anti-status quo positions, or maybe his sense of humor, which could be, in a way, also Iranian? To learn more about this, I'm now joined by Kamran Baradaran, one of Zizek's translators into Persian. Kamran Baradaran is an author, critic, musician, translator and journalist. Uh, he has translated works of philosophers including Jean Baudrillard, Antonio Gramsci, Paul Virilio and Savoy Zizek into Persian. Also in the field of literature he has translated works of Gilles Cooper, Hector Munro, Luigi Pirandello. Uh, our interlocutor has also published a book on feminine writing called Feminine Writing Improvisation in the Mist. And he is also known as a senior journalist specialized in international politics with articles appearing in Iran and around the world. Uh, he is also the editorial consultant of Philosophy World Democracy Journal. So, Kamran, I'm happy you're here with us. Uh, thank you that you accepted our proposal. And I hope you are fine there in Iran. Thank you much, Vladimir. Uh, it was an honor to be here with you. And... Uh... I hope things are well with you too. So, uh, how did it happen that Zizek became so popular in Iran? Which books by him are translated? Which, who are the translators? And what is the public image he has? And respectively, what is the Iranians' reaction to his ideas? Well, uh, first of all, I have to surprise you by... Uh, a challenging statement that I think Slovak is not popular in Iran, despite the fact that many books of his have been translated into Persian. Um, but before that, uh, let me give you uh, like a brief story how I encountered with philosophy of Slovak in the first place. Um, I think it was like uh, ten years ago or eleven years ago. I was like twenty-one. 22 at most, and uh, I was really young. Um, and back then, I was a big fan of Michel Foucault, the famous French philosopher. And uh, and I was, and I still am, a big fan of uh, David Lynch movies. Um, I remember I, I was reading about Lynch, uh, the philosophy of his um, films and a friend of mine back then told me that the, there is a book um, about you know um, the David Lynch uh, Lost Highway movie so uh, he told me that there is a guy named Slavoj Zizek uh, and he has a book called The Art of Pretty Close Sublime um, on David Lynch, uh, Lost Highway. So that was my first encounter. I remember um, that uh, my friend gave me the book and I had no idea who Jack was or uh, who he were. So I wrote the book with uh, a bit of suspicion. I was okay, this is just kind of a stupid book about uh, forcing some ideas to some scenes in movies. So uh, I was prepared to be uh, not surprised by the book, but I remember very clearly that when I finished reading the book, I it was like I hit a brick wall. I was stunned for like days because the way Savage, uh, you know, had read David Lynch's Lost Highway um, and the way he invites uh, the reader to re-examine um, his assumption and 
critical trends of uh, that particular movie really astonished me to the very bone. Uh, so after that, I got uh, interested in Slavoj Vuk. I, I searched about him and I saw that some of his books were published back then in Persian. Um, so that was my first encounter with Slavoj Zizek uh, philosophy. Uh, in the flesh, but uh, to give you a bit of history on how Zizek penetrated, in a way, the Iranian intellectual life, um, I think the first people who um, translated uh, his work to Persian were Murat Fahad Pur, um, Saleh Najafi, and Omid Mehregan. And I think uh, Mazir Islami, yes. And Mazir Islami was the translator of that book of Zizek about David Lynch, the other ridiculous, ridiculous subline. And so these three or these four were the first translators who uh, introduced Zizek's philosophy uh, to Iranian leaders. And they translated um, some of his books and a collection of his articles. And it was, a, uh, it was like uh, 1384, which uh, in Persian uh, calendar, which means it was like uh, 16 years ago. So they, they first translated that 16 years ago. So, and back then, Iran um, intellectual circles were dominated by philosophers like Jean Boudrillard and Jacques Turida, Hans Kadamer, Heidegger, in a way. Uh, so that's books that first were pop, um, translated into Persian really divided the whole intellectual sphere of Iran, and as far as I can recollect. Um, postmodernism as a, you know, as a um, subordinated line of thought was really popular in Iran, and Zizek and his uh, books really turned that illusion apart. So it was a big thing back then, and it, it still is, in, in a way. Um, and. After the few that Zizek got really popular in Iran, uh, in a way that I think was really subversive, because you know Zizek talks about uh, stuff that uh, nobody really pays attention to. He talks about popular culture, the popular cinemas, and normally when a philosopher is talking about like a movie or like a, like a um, cinematographer, they usually talk about you know good uh, good old. Uh, Filmmakers like Andrei Tarkovsky, uh, Kislev Kislovsky, and, and so on, but he had took the um, he, he had the courage to talk about movies that, um, according to most philosophers, were not worthy enough to pay attention to, like Alfred Hitchcock, I don't know, David Lynch, popular culture, um, detective stories. So that made things more interesting, I think, for the Iranian leaders. Uh, at a certain point, especially in the field of uh, cinema, uh, anyone who wanted to write an essay or a book about um, the philosophy of cinema, he would inevitably uh, refer to Zizek and his ideas. And that might be uh, a sign of being popular, uh, and some would argue that because of this, Slavoj is really popular in Iran, and um, but uh, to my um, reading, the way I see it, is that because of this, because of uh, this um, enthusiasm towards Slavoj, his main ideas, his main philosophy, was underrated in Iran, because because uh, in, in a way, Slavoj is mostly known in Iran as a political philosopher or as an no, art critic or so on. But the main thing is the main point of Zizek is if you have if you read good books about Zizek and if you read his uh, books, you see that uh, the way he uh, portrays um, an issue is deeply based in a philosophical uh, background. So if you want to really understand what Zizek is talking about. You have to read. Uh, you have to have good knowledge of uh, Marx, of Hegel, Freud, and Lacan. Uh, Schelling, also. So uh, 
I think most of these undergrounds, so this basic uh, ground of Zizek books are uh, underrated in Iran. And because of that, I think Zizek is not well known and popular enough as it uh, should be. Uh, so people always uh, take him um, granted for things that I think are um, less uh, interesting than what he's actually doing. So uh, in a way, I believe that uh, Zizek is not popular in Iran, he's, but just, just that Iran are interested, interested in him. But they do not want to get deep in his idea, in his works, and his philosophical background. So, well, I understand that Zizek broadens the world view of Iranians as well as his other readers in other countries. Uh, but uh, to what extent the other uh, my other suggestions could be true that he is also interesting because he is anti-status quo and he is seen always as some kind of underdog who fights uh, a dominant hegemonic narrative and to what extent maybe his sense of humor is it also close to the Iranian sense of humor you know kind of auto depreciating sense of humor maybe or uh, maybe also a very gentle or how can I say sophisticated way of saying to the other that he's maybe stupid mm -hmm. um, well um, naturally Zizek has always uh, been a philosopher against the status quo that is his main um, philosophy is to reinvent the ideas that were uh, that were presupposed uh, as n normal and natural. So his main work, I believe, is uh, to uh, have a parallax view at the issue that we consider normal. And that naturally, uh, you know, um, makes you like isolated. And on the other hand, uh, as far as I know, I've, I've never been to Eastern Europe, uh, either Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, whatever, but the way I've heard and the way I uh, understand being a leftist, not, not just any leftist, but being a communist in uh, this day and age and in the countries such as Eastern Europe is uh, really a taboo in a way uh, because of the Stalinist era and all the killing and so on. So uh, when you consider, when you uh, portray yourself as a leftist and as a communist and to top that off, it makes you isolated whether you want it or not. On the other hand, um, Zizek ideas are based in the fact that the status quo, that the current um, situation of the world is corrupted as such, which means that you cannot just change it with a few um, reforms and so on. You have to reinvent the whole framework and change the whole structure. That generates the problems we're having today. That means going after the big guys. That means going after the main reason of our desperate situation. That usually, uh, because of the long history of Iranian struggle against totalitarianship, um, makes him uh, desirable for Iranian leaders. And at the same time, he, um, the way he uh, presents his ideas, the way he talks about his philosophy, is in a way funny and deep at the same time. So that's something you can't find in normal uh, philosophers. So that might be one of the reasons that he's uh, you know, so much popular in, for Iranian leaders. Okay. Um, so Iranians have some idea about his books and his um, concepts, but how familiar is Zizek the Iranian thought? Um, well, Zizek has uh, um, written uh, many books, as you know, I think more than 30 or 40 books. And in um, all of his um, works, Zizek has been really, um, you know, um, how, how should I put this? He, he has been following every um, big event in all around the world, whether it be the Arab Spring or uh, the situation in Iran or uh, Hong Kong or I don't know. Um, the Bar movement. Um, the thing is that uh, when you want to 
be a good philosopher the way I see it. Being a good philosopher means to have a good eyes and ears for every little detail in the world today. And that is uh, the motto of Shishak. Like when you read, uh, for example, his uh, book on the financial crisis, first as tragedy, then as farce, normally you have the idea, okay, he's going to talk about the United States and the Wall Street and so on, but when you read the book, you see many references to Iran, to the political situation in Iran, and uh, so that uh, may surprise you how um, well informed he is about the situation, the political and the cultural life of Iranian people. And at the same time, uh, he has uh, reacted to many uh, events in the last decade uh, that, ha that's, that has been happening in Iran. For example, the assassination of um, you know, uh, Qasem Soleimani, he wrote uh, a wonderful text about it. And he looked at it in a way that most people you know, don't expect a philosopher to look at it. So uh, I would say he's quite well informed about the situation in Iran, and he has a good idea of what is going on right now with this country. So how did he look at the murder of Qasem Soleimani, in short? Um, the way he looked at it, I think, um, and I, um, I, I think it's one of the you know, genius points of being the philosopher that Zizek is, that he looks at it uh, in a paradoxical um, view, because uh, he talked about the whole thing, that um, the main loser of this uh, crisis between Iran and the United States were, are, and uh, it will be Europe itself. Uh, the way Zizek looks at it, that between this uh, hegemonical and geopolitical conflicts, the main point for Europe as a, a, a player in this game is to maintain its independence and at the same time try to resolve the situation, not just being drowned in another long fights like uh, uh, Europe did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, so, um, I understand that you have had a personal relationship, even a friendship with him. So, I remember that um, uh, Zizek once quoted a joke you told him, and uh, he referred to you as his great Iranian friend. So, uh, could you tell us more about your personal communication with him and what it is like to be an Iranian friend of Zizek? Um, well, uh, the way I get to know, again, I, I you know, get in touch and get to know Zizek personally is actually a funny story. Um, as you know, I'm a journalist in the international relation, so my job is to do interviews with um, the political analysts and um, those who have something to say about the whole political situation of the world. Uh, after a certain point, um, I started working on the um, traumas that has been haunting the left uh, for ages, like the fall of Berlin Wall. The reason why we don't have a, a good old uh, socialist uh, government anymore, and why left is being marginated day by day. So, to make that goal happen, I started, uh, you know, um, doing interviews with um, known philosophers and intellectuals from all around the world, um, like Robert Fowler, Simon Hajdini. Um, Adrian Johnson, Agon Hamza, Frank Ruda, and so on. In one of the interviews I did uh, was with uh, Frank Ruda, the well-known uh, German intellectual and writer, and a good friend of Zizek. Back then, and it was like, I think, three years ago, or three years ago and a half, and back then I was eager to get in touch uh, with Zizek to have an interview with him. Um, and when I finished my interview with uh, Frank Ruda, I asked him that, you know, do you have uh, any email or any contact info of Slovoy. And he said that uh, you can write what you want to say and send it to me by email. And, I, and then I will forward it to Zizek himself. And if he decides to respond, then you will hear from him. So I wrote like a big text <laughs> um, admiring Zizek, that, telling him that I, I'm eager to do an interview with you. Um, and uh, surprisingly, he 
responded a couple of days after, and uh, we managed to do four or five interviews, and we became friends. And we, this friendship has been going uh, on since then. And he, he has been tremendously kind to me. And um, so, yeah, that, that's how I got involved with Jürgen himself. Okay, and I understand that you try to publish those interviews in Iran right now. Um, yeah, I'm I'm currently working on those uh, interviews, and the other project that I have been uh, working on um, is um, publishing the unpublished text by Jujek himself. Uh, so he sent me like um, maybe f- six or seven of his unpublished texts, and I'm at the moment working on an introduction for them to publish them in Europe. And another project that I'm currently working on is a book that I call After the Wall, uh, which is a combination of interviews with um, known philosophers around the world, including Zizek, uh, Agon Hamza, um, Divya Diviodi from India, Jean-Luc Nancy, and so on. And, and um, the whole main point of this book is to focus on the traumas and the uh, defeats of the left in the 20th and 21st century. So what will happen with these um, publications? Do you expect them to come out soon? Um, I'm at the moment um, working with some publishers and uh, you know the final edits. So I think um, these three projects are going to come out like um, in 2021, maybe, or maybe in the early 2022. Okay. Uh, I would like to move a little bit to politics, hard politics, because Iran is known as a country that uh, forms the axis of resistance in the Middle East, and it is a resistance against Western hegemony. And how much Zizek can be an ally in that fight? I mean, does he... he He's anti-status quo, but uh, what is his personal fight, in your view, as a thinker? What does he try to achieve? Um, um, well, um, first of all, let me um, explain this. That from a Jacobin point of view, the good old uh, Western uh, hegemony that uh, we have to, as leftists, we have to fight the Western hegemony. That uh, game is over. I mean, at the moment, we are uh, dealing with a world so complicated that you can't just uh, find one bad guy and point it out and start fighting with it. Back in the day, like um, before the Berlin Wall fell down, you could at least have a good idea of what it is like to be, you know, fighting capitalism. For example, you had like United States, um, UK at uh, some point, but at the moment um, the situation is so complicated that the United States is not like the big evil anymore, and you have China at the um, at one hand, Russia and Putin on the other hand, and you have these um, war regimes, that I call them, that they are anti-capitalist uh, in their uh, appearance, but deep down they are working and functioning as a brutal capitalist state, like uh, countries in uh, Eastern Asia and in North of Africa. So the main point, what Zizek has uh, has to offer in this world is that fighting the capitalist hegemonic is not as easy as it uh, used to be. And because of that, because of the change in the geopolitical game, you have to change your um, point of view as well. So you have to find those um, you know, small lines, those small spots in which you can be anti capitalist and you can uh, fight the you know, dominant hegemonic. Um, one thing that uh, has been bothering me, especially um, when it comes to um, the situation um, in Iran, is that most of the intellectuals in uh, Iran society are, in a way, um, um, arrogant against the, um, the whole change in the geopolitical game. As I mentioned earlier, we have China at the one hand and Russia on the other other hand. And the intellectuals, um, whether they are right or left, they tend to uh, forget about these two 
access. Uh, for example, if you are a cliche leftist, um, intellectual in Iran, you usually don't want to get near to the whole game of criticizing Russia and China because in a way they have, especially China, because China has a communist, um, at what I call propaganda. And on the other hand, if you are a cliche liberal intellectual in Iran, you usually uh, criticize China and Russia for being or having the communist uh, approach. What uh, Zizek has taught me, at least, is that these two options, these two uh, approaches, the cliche left, uh, leftist uh, approach and the cliche liberal approach, these two are the two sides of the same coin. They both don't know what they're talking about and they both uh, do not have the courage to accept the fact that we are entering and have entered a new sphere and a new world. And to do so, we have to change our whole point of view. We have to have the courage of hopelessness, to be hopeless enough to know that we have no idea what's going on and start our uh, struggle from the level zero. Uh, I'm, I, I, I can't resist of uh, giving you a, you know, a, a good joke. Um, you know the uh, Romanian writer, uh, I'm not sure if I'm um, saying his name right, uh, Panait Istrati. Uh, he was a, uh, uh, he was a, uh, uh, so um, in, there's a joke that when uh, this uh, Romanian communist writer, Panait Istrati, visited the Soviet Union in the mid-1930s, uh, uh, and you know, that was a time of big purges and short trials in Soviet Union. Uh, a Soviet uh, apologist trying to convince him about the need for violence against the enemies, enemies uh, evoked uh, the proverb, uh, and he said that you can make an omelet without breaking eggs, uh, to which uh, Istrati uh, replied, all right, I can see the broken eggs. What is the omelet you're talking about? I, I would say the same thing about all this uh, nonsense that uh, the so-called intellectuals are talking about fighting the capitalist hegemony when they uh, tend to uh, forget about the hegemonic uh, power of China and Russia. Okay, we are breaking uh, your eggs. I, I'm seeing that you are breaking your eggs, but where the hell is this omelette you are promising us? That's a strong point. And uh, I understand that Zizek really uh, somehow manages to challenge everything simultaneously. And maybe that is uh, his subversive power. Uh, but um, I still have some curiosity for Iranian's attitude towards the West. Because I, I have felt that it is a complex one. Uh, usually you can hear... Uh, some chants like death to America, etc. But uh, in fact, um, a lot of um, European philosophy, for example, has been appropriated or interiorized by Iranians. Like, for example, Heidegger mm -hmm. is very well known in Iran. And other, uh, like you said, postmodernists. Uh, so, um, mm -hmm. and Zizek is another philosopher who is even if he's anti-status quo, he comes from the West. So, um, maybe a few questions here, but I hope you manage somehow to take on them. Where does this kind of fascination for European philosophy comes from? And how does it coexist with the Islamic tendency in the country? Um, well, as I said before, um comparing to philosophers like Heidegger and Nietzsche, for example, and Zizek is really not that popular in Iran. Um, some people um, might disagree, but uh, I strongly believe that uh, the picture we have in Iran of philosophers like Slavo Zizek is um, it's a disfigured uh, picture. Because uh, as I said, if you really want to have a good idea of what Zizek is talking about, you have to have a good idea of, uh, of the works of philosophers like Marx, Hegel, uh, Lacan, and so on. So most of the time, people have no idea of this uh, theoretical background. And at the same time, this uh, 
has uh, this, la- this 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 uh, this stupidity that I call leads to portraying Zizek as just a normal uh, political philosopher, which is not what Zizek is at all. If Zizek is a deep uh, and complicated philosopher, and to read his books and ideas needs uh, a good amount of time, and you have to uh, you know dig deep to understand what he's talking about. Uh, most of his books, like uh, Less Than Nothing, for example, it's, a, it's about uh, 1,000 pages about Lacan and Hegel. Nobody is talking about that in Iran because they don't have enough knowledge to talk about that. So they just um, disgrace Zizek as a normal philosophical, um, a normal political philosopher. Um, and again, <laughs> I can't resist but to tell you a good joke that Zizek also loves. Um, and this might answer to the whole question of um, being uh, a Zizekian and, uh, in, a, in, in Iran's today and what does it mean uh, for uh, an Iranian leader to be a Zizekian in the current state of Iran. So this joke goes to the early 1960s and uh, in a way it nicely renders the paradox of presupposed belief. Uh, you know, uh, Yuri Gagarin, the guy who went to the moon uh, and me- went to the space. And when he returned from the space, uh, he was received by uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the general secretary of the Communist Party. Uh, so Gagarin told Khrushchev uh, confidentially that, you know, comrade, that, that up there in the sky, I saw heaven with God and angel Christianity. And Christianity is right. Khrushchev uh, whispered back to him, I know, I know, but keep that quiet. Don't tell anyone about this. Next week, and uh, Yuri Gagarin visited the Vatican and was received by Pope himself, uh, to whom he uh, confides, you know, Holy Father, I was up there in the sky and I saw there, there is no God, no angels. There comes the wonderful reply of the Pope. I know, I know, but keep it quiet. Don't tell it to anyone. That is the whole <laughs> idea of uh, being a Zizekian in a situation like this. And what, what Zizek has taught us, not, 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 just, not, not just us in Iran, but many of his leaders all around the world, is this uh, presupposed belief that uh, um, the guys like Khrushchev knows that there is, uh, that, the, that, that their ideas are not worth anything. And the other side knows that there's little worse in their side as the other. So I understand, it's a great joke, by the way, but I understand that um, uh, Zizek has also, he has at least two faces. I mean, one is the philosopher who writes serious books and you need to know a lot in order to understand him, but he's also a popular face, like on the TV, he writes for media, and he's much easier to understand when he writes journalistic texts. So I just... But I must add one, 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 uh, I have to add one thing. At the same time that uh, you know, he's really popular, and uh, not, just, not only in Iran, but all around the world, but for the last couple of years, like the last five or six years, his popularity uh, has uh, been damaged. Why? Because you know, back before, uh, like five or six years ago, you could find texts by Slavoj like, everywhere. New York Times, maybe... Uh, Russia today, everywhere you could find a text by him, and uh, you know BBC everywhere you could find the face of Sojiyev. But at a certain point, uh, he is became becoming more and more marginalized. The reason is that he is, as I said before, he's attacked, he's attacking not just the normal order of thing, but the framework that uh, generates this um, desperate deadlock. For instance, um, if you look at the situation in um, between the Israel and Palestine, the true courage of Israel comes in, a, in, in, in this moment that he openly criticizes uh, Israeli government, and he he's talking about uh, the in a way the killings that have that has been going on there for years. So that's really um, um, upset many people. So he's not as popular as he used to be, but at this, but this un- unpopularity, I think, is the true uh, identity and the true spirit of philosophers like Slovakia, that they have the courage to stand up 
and say what's on their mind and say what they have to say without uh, being worried about being marginalized and being uh, deserted. So, in the end of the day, Zizek is uh, somebody who is uh, uh, who has the confidence and the uh, culture and the accumulation to be a free thinker. And maybe, maybe uh, it is a rare uh, occasion to have a free thinker, really th- free thinker in our times. Mm-hmm. Um, does this mean that uh, Zizek is... Um, the kind of positive West to which people from the East can, uh, with which they can associate more easily. Like, you know, West is not one thing, but maybe he's the progressive part of the West. Is it like that for you? Um, it is like that for me, but for another reason, uh, for the wrong reasons, <laughs> if, if you want. And the good thing about Zizek that when you read his books, when you read his uh, ideas, is that uh, you, um, when you read Zizek ideas, you, do, you don't see all these uh, normal cliche you know, promises of better days, that things would be better, and uh, if, if you just do this and that, things would uh, get better. The ultimate goal of Zizek, what, uh, if, if you want to sum up, what is his uh, best teaching, for me at least, is the fact that he is a pessimist guy, not a nihilist, of course, but he's a pessimist that knows that when you're in a tunnel and you see that the tunnel is dark, but you see the light at the end of the tunnel, Zizek uh, warns that that light might not be a good, a good news. It might be the train that is coming to you and it's going to crush you. <laughs> so that, uh, that, that, that is what Zizek calls the, College of hopelessness, uh, and you can find this line in many of the philosophers after Zizek, uh, like Mark Fisher, uh, who has uh, died a couple of years ago, unfortunately. And this College of hopelessness is the ultimate, is the uh, I think the the thing that we need today. As, uh, when, uh, for example, when uh, when there was the Arab Spring, you remember, and that there was um, protests in Egypt, in Algeria, and so on. Most of the leftists uh, were really enthusiastic about the whole thing, but the only, not not the only, but one of the few people who had doubts about the whole thing was, was Zizek, not in a uh, cynical way. He said that, okay, okay, all these images of people on the streets and the Tahrir Square protesting and so on, that's nice, but what about the day after? What are you going to do when the dust settles? That is the main challenge. The, the main challenge today is it's like you know, you know the that, that's, that's the example that you use all the time. You know the movie V for Vendetta, that has been popular all around the world. Um, in the final scene of V for Vendetta, we see people are going to the parliament and uh, you know taking to the streets and you know winning the whole situation. The main question that someone, the only people who is tr- courageous enough to ask is Zizek that okay, um, you, you you got the parliament, you you take the streets. The street is yours now. What about what? What's next? What are you gonna do the day after the, the the revolution? That's the main question, and that's the question that nobody is courageous, courageous enough to, to ask that. And that is uh, what's really important in Jack folks that he dares to ask the questions that everybody tries to avoid. Okay, I understand that you have a strong relation with him both personal and on level of ideas. Uh, So uh, let us finish with, um, once again, with a reference to your friendship with him. Uh, Do you think you will meet him someday in person? And uh, do you think he will be outside cameras? When cameras are off, he's the person which uh, you expect him to be. And what is, in fact... What do you think he looks like when he's not uh, mediatized? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and last time I talked to Zizek, and it was maybe like a month or two, um, um, I was talking about an article I was writing, um, and he, uh, he, uh, we, we talked about it that there might be a time that uh, we could meet because you know, the pandemic has ruined everything for everyone. Uh, especially in Europe, uh, I realize that in Europe uh, things are 
uh, getting better, but here we are still have we are still dealing with the pandemic. So uh, there might be a time that we we could meet, and that would be an honor, a lifetime honor for me. Uh, I would um, love to meet the guy, and it's I, I I would consider it a great achievement to meet this great philosopher and this great friend of mine um, in person. But uh, but what you said about you know he him being uh, the same person uh, off the camera as he is represented. Um, this is again one thing that I've learned from Zizek that um, the whole point of uh, the inner self, like this whole uh, illusion of having an inner self, is the dominant um, idea of today's capitalism. If you ask any guy who is working in the Wall Street or uh, who is working like uh, in, who, who, who is the owner of like Tesla and you know, Amazon and so on, you will see that they all have one thing in common and that they have an emphasis on having a true inner self and true inner self is a myth the way i see it the, the real you the real thing that uh, exists is what you put out outside that's what you do in your writing in your interviews in your i don't know um everyday life that is the real uh, person that we have this goes also for Zizek himself. I believe that the real Zizek that I got, I got to know is the Zizek that I read in his books and uh, in his ideas. Okay, Kamran, thank you very much for this discussion. And um, uh, it looks like there Zizek is uh, uh, so creative, maybe, or your relationship to him is so strong that um, this is maybe only the beginning of some reflection on Zizek, which I may like also to do in the future again. So thank you. I do hope so. Thank you so much, Vladimir. It was a great honor. Thank you for having me.